today's webinar is about the effect of wild gassing condition on the solvents. And the motivation behind this work is that there is lots of controversy in terms of absorption data and absorbent capacities in the literature. And this can be attributed to the fact that not too many researchers actually publishing the, uh, the preconditioning informations. Because in some cases, the temperature may be too high, which can result in uh, good adsorption capacity if it's a good thermoester material. But if the temperature is too low, it can result in uh, low adsorption capacity or destroying the material. So today, I would like to discuss and demonstrate a few examples how these conditions can actually affect the adsorption capacity. So I'm going to remove the camera because I can't see my screen. Uh, OK. So first, of two, this is a brief overview of my talk. So I'm going to talk about the <clears throat> first, in general, in general time of outgassing, then uh, why is important. So the main reason is the collection of physics option isotherms. Then I'm going to focus on the gravity metro methods because the surface mass measurement system manufacture gravity metric methods that we have a uh, DVS analyzer which provides its option data. Then show example of outgassing data and uh, also the effect of outgassing of data on carbon dioxide and water absorption on zeolites and walls and then we make the conclusions. You might all have heard about the outgassing. So what's the outgassing? Outgassing is the release is the release of, uh, sorry, it's making me, of gas, which was trapped or previously dissolved, or frozen in uh, or absorbed in variety of materials into the environment. You might be aware there is lots of talks in uh, news about the outgassing of volatile organic compound, compounds or VOCs. And this is another type of outgassing. So the outgassing of VOCs refers to release of these molecules into a closed environment, which creates stagnant or stale air. And as an example, we can take building materials, new furniture, or infamous new car smell. So whenever you go into the new car, you get this new car. And we don't realize that the actual, these com compounds can be actually uh, ha uh, harmful when they are in the release in the contained uh, environment, and may, in my can they possess some uh, health risks. Also, the other example of outgassing or large scales is outgassing of the planet. So during this, we observe the release of gases during volcanic eruptions, and this is an example of extreme outgassing conditions. So here, what we're looking at is the picture of a monument uh, mount. Minatubo. And what we see here is a column of gas and ash rising from Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines, just days just before the volcano, Vulcano's climatic explosion, explosion in uh, 1991. So, but our main focus is basically to discuss outgassing the adsorbent. So, what is actually outgassing of the adsorbent means is is a process of removing gas or vapor molecules from a sample. It's a very important process. It is we're going to be discussing in the detail today. So what the main sources of these uh, molecules are water vapor, solvents, VOCs, air, and also it can be oil vapors, grease. So all these is, which is actually stay trapped inside the material. And the main uh, aim of this is actually achieve sufficient cleanliness of the surface. So that's why we are outgassing. This term is mainly popular with less vacuum application. So what are typical outgassing conditions? So first one is the temperature. So simple example of outgassing is, is uh, you take the solvent, you put it in the oven at 300 degrees, and uh, for certain amount of the time, so the second condition is the time, how long you should leave it in the oven at this temperature. So, Temperature type are important parameters for the outgassing. The third parameter is inner gas flushing. So what it is means is basically another way, because oven is stationary, so we don't have flow of the gas. So in order to increase the outgassing rate, so we can actually flow the gas, inner gas across the sample. 
The other example of guessing is vacuum, which takes usually place below one Pascal or 0.005 or typically uh, outgassing and vacuum is done on the high vacuum, let's say about 10 minus 6 or now this is typical outgassing for or drying for pharmaceutical samples. So strongly bound molecules needs these vacuum forces to be found, pulled out from the surface. Now, in some cases, the use of only temperature or inert gas or vacuum is not enough. So we need to have the combination of the either flushing of inert inert gas over the sample at uh, elevated temperature or combination of vacuum and temperature yeah and uh, this is important in order to achieve complete cleanliness of the surface it is also as you be, might be aware most of you call like this let's say physics option anisotherms using liquid nitrogen and one of the other recommendation is the exposure to the surface high vacuum and temperatures before the data collection so there is also a few concerns regarding outgassing. So the, the selection of the conditions is very important. So we can, uh, we can perform outgassing at low temperatures of thermally stable material. If we do so, this can provide incomplete cleaning of the porous surface. I got a very example for this. The other example, contrary, we can do outgassing at elevated temperatures of, a centi of temperature sensitive material, which can cause irreversible structural changes, which will have profound effects on adsorption capacity. And I will demonstrate both of these examples uh, later in my talk on water absorption and carbon dioxide. Now, why you, many of you might question why I'm talking about outgassing. And the reason is, is determination of physics option isotherms. Those, and if I go back to our packet recommendations, and one of the key things is the prior to determination of the adsorption isotherm, all this is all the species should be removed from the surface of the adsorbent while avoiding irreversible changes of the surface or the solid structure. So this is the key parameter, which is very often not discussed in uh, publications or research report. Those the important despite the fact is the importance of these outgassing conditions. So, what methods we have we can use for determination of this option as a term? So, typically, most common method is manometric method or volumetric methods, which are used for collection of uh, B liquid nitrogen option as a term. So, in this case, we, we measure the amount of gas removed from the gas phase. So prior to the measurements, you have to determine that volume. And then we dose the amount of the gas or known volume into the sub and determine the amount of all. The other method, which is direct method, is a gravimetric method. And which is gravimetric is a direct measurements of the uptake of gas or vapor molecules. And the purpose of this talk today is going to be mainly to focus on outgassing conditions and uh, Absorption isotherm collections using gravimetric method. So I'm going to discuss more, spend a few minutes to discuss this gravimetric method more in detail and what are main points or advantages of this method. So first thing in, uh, which we need to remember the gravimetric method is the measurement of the change in mass of the adsorbent during the out, outgassing and adsorption, desorption of vapor or gas molecules. This method also allows us to monitor progress of in situ outgassing by tracking change of weight of the adsorbent and pressure by vacuum cages. And this is a very powerful because this is not possible to do it using the manometric method. But the reason is this method be using gravimetric use, as its name says, we're using the microbalance or balance to continuously weigh the sample. Whereas in volumetric method, you have to, you just have to fill in the column with your absorbent, and then you might weigh before outgassing, after outgassing. It does not give you this direct in situ or real time measurements of the outgassing curves, when you can see whether the material is completely dry or not. And lastly, we can also 
collect the additional information, like uh, for instance, qualitative information during the outgassing uh, absorbent using the temperature or by dissolving, by uh, releasing, by performing dissorption measurements, by coupling, let's say, the gravimetric system with uh, mass spectrometry in order to opt, uh, analyze evolved gas. So during the physisorption process, several things happening in the background. So typically what we have, we have the flux of uh, vapor molecules or gas molecules, which uh, reacts with the solid surface of sample. And during this uh, contact with a solid, they either get weakly bound uh, to the surface. It, then in this case, we're talking about the adsorption process, or some of the molecules penetrate into the bulk, which define the absorption of the process, and the rest of the molecules coming out of the sample. So this is a typical physics option process, which takes place during the collection of physics option isotherm. Now, we cannot really distinguish between adsorption and absorption. That's why we usually use the common term absorption, which describes both uh, processes. Now, so when we introduce plasma molecules, we know exact concentration. So as you go to concentration, uh, so, but when we reduce the more concentration of the molecules coming into the chamber, What's happening, we can actually dissolve the molecules. So molecule is coming off the surface or they're coming from the bar. So in that case, we're talking about the desorption process. And this is the control by initial concentration of the or partial pressure which coming in into the sample. Now the physisorption process can be empirically expressed by physisorption isotherms. So what we see here, we have the picture of a uh, this is option isotherm. So what we can see here on x-axis, we have the relative pressure, which is displayed as P or P naught, while you actually change the mass or the amount of absorbed. And inside we have the two four curves, which are overlapping nicely. So we have the adsorption and desorption curve. So what we have here is a relationship between the amount of uh, water vapor absorbed versus the equilibrium uh, partial pressure of water. Now, P over P naught, in this case, means P is the pre-measured pressure, P naught is the saturation pressure of the water at the operational temperature. So we're looking at here type four isotherms, and which is uh, typical by this huge hysteresis graph. But during the adsorption processes, several processes taking place. First, we had the monolayer adsorption, multilayer adsorption, condensation before, so bulk absorption, and hydration reaction. The adsorption isotherms were collected over years and they were uh, classified into the six groups. So the old classification is on the left-hand side, the new classification is right-hand side, which takes into the account this new type of material and morphs scores. So I'm gonna go briefly through this. So we can have typically the type one isotherms. This is what I'm gonna show quite a lot today. So the type one uh, isotherms are typical for microporous materials. So the, the external surface area of the material of the sorbent is very small, typically for zeolites. So the adsorption capacity is dominated by the micropore filling, especially at very low relative pressures. Then we have the type two or type four isotherms. So you have the monolayer. So in the case of type two isotherms, is a monolayer formation by multilayer formation, infinite. In type four, which is in a way is followed the type two isotherms, and you have the monolayer followed by multilayer formation, followed by pore filling and condensation and or pore condensation. So what it means, pore condensations refers to the condensive or the adsorptive inside, inside of the pores uh, below the saturation pressure of the adsorptive. Okay, and then we have some other types of isotherms, we like type five, and type six cubic substance. Now, now, I would like you to introduce the method which allows you to actually collect these adsorption, desorption isotherms and also monitor in situ gravimetric outgassing conditions. So 
the method the system is called dynamic reabsorption vacuum or DVS vacuum, and it provides you thermodynamic data. Yeah. So one of the main benefits of the system is uh, like real-time monitoring of vacuum outgasses at the relative temperatures. It provides a clean environment for air or moisture sensitive samples. It does, it collects through water or organic vapor absorption isothermal absorbents. So there is no interference from carrier gas. So what it means, the system measures directly partial pressure of water. Okay. And this is very important for materials which might suffer from the uh, effect of the carrier gas on the structure. So, but the systems, we can generate the vapors using the evaporation under the vacuum at experimental temperature, thermodynamic equilibrium. So we, in this system, the headspace of the liquid is taken and bled uh, into the system. While we directly measure the partial pressure of water using the baratone. Um, the other uh, important uh, fact is that it allows to concentrate measurements of the isotopes very low concentration, which cannot be actually a flow absorption instrument. Now, let me elab uh, elaborate on this a little bit because there is there are absorb DVS absorption instruments which requires carrier gas like nitrogen air for its operation, and in order to perform water absorption isotopes, it is required the carrier gas to be saturated to be mixed with saturated wet stream of water or organic solvents. Now, when you perform the isotherms, there is also the limit how low you can go, and the limit is just basically mass flow or control, how low, you, how low you can generate POP not. So that's why the benefits of vacuum is that we can go extremely low conditions. There is no effect of carrier gas. You can go gas absorption up to one bar using CO2, SO2, hydrogen, ammonia. And co-absorption is starting in dynamic flow mode. I'm not going to go into the detail. We already done webinars on it. And also the other parameters like fast equilibriums, absorption cycling, and uh, easy state heat of absorption. Just briefly, so what this system consists of is the vacuum chamber with the balance here. From uh, balance, we have suspended two hanging down wires. So on the left-hand side, we have sample. Or right-hand side is the reference side. Around the sample side, we have a high temperature preheater in order to outgas samples in situ. Then we have the two baratons to measure absolute pressure and two MFCs for upstream control and two baratons and butterfly for downstream control. Outside, we have the vacuum gauge, so for in situ monitoring of outgassing, and so of the terrible molecular molecular pumps. So, in it, system is capable of two operational modes one is dynamic, the other one is static. So in dynamic, we have the both control of upstream and uh, downstream. So in typical experiments, you set the partial pressure of water, let's say one tor, the downstream is closed. So the, uh, the pumps are isolated from the vacuum chamber. This, uh, the, the set pressure is reached. Then the pressure keeps going up. As a result, we have the closed loop control between butterfly valve and baratrons. Uh, valve receives the feedback. The pressure vents over the set point and it opens. And does reduce the amount of water of inside. So it also controls resin style of the sorbate inside the chamber. So that's important importance. So in a dynamic mode, the flow, the vapors of the sample will keep the pressure constant, but continuously measure weight of the sorbate. Also, it can run in the static mode, which is very similar to the manometric systems. But once again, we don't know, we don't exactly know the amount of the gas dose, but we rely on the measurements of uh, balance, which are again continuously record the changes in the weight of the soil. So there are two many modes. And just briefly to give you an idea how to change the samples, you can easy very easy by just undoing these two clumps, this drops down, <clears throat> and you get to the access sample side. Now, we have those two sets of the MFC, as I mentioned. So one is for the pure water vapor. So here, there is your solvents sitting in this reservoir. Second, the MFC is for the gases. So it allows you to do quads or multi-components option experiment by mixing water CO2 in different flow ratio, or by performing the static water CO2 adsorption measurement, then you first saturate the sample with the water, and then you bring the CO2 on top of it. So, so how this uh, system actually works? So let me explain here. So on the left-hand side, we have the schematic of our operation. So as I said, the most important parameter, first important is outgassing. So what it means, so we load the sample into the metal pump, 
then we apply the vacuum. If the vacuum is not enough, we can uh, apply the elevated temperatures and we leave the sample for several hours. As a result, we observe loss in sample mass. So the mass, so mass loss. So this is the outgassing state. Once the sample is brought to <coughs> absorption temperature, let's say 25 degrees, we introduce, let's say, water vapor or gas molecules. And once we reach a steady state, then we have the flow of the vapor or gas molecules over the sample, we waiting for the mass equilibrium with, uh, with uh, vapor molecules. So this can be seen here. So once we increase the pressure in this scale of water, which is solid blue line, we observe a huge in gain in the weight of the sample. Okay, so this is during the adsorption process. Now, as you're increasing the concentration of the molecules, the mass going up. And in each step, we're waiting for certain amount for certain time to reach the mass equilibrium. And from this equilibrium point, we calculate the physics option isotherms. As you can see here, type one, adsorption branch in the red, desorption in blue. So this is a typical operation of the system. Now, I now move to the important part, which is the, of the store, which is real time monitoring of outgassing of this orbit. So what it means for this, so we need a vacuum high temperature. I spoke about the pressure measurements. For high temperature, we use our high temperature preheater. Picture is shown here, here, made of stainless steel. So this is the miniature radiator style preheater. In this preheater, important parameter is we have the PT100, which is directly below metal pan to measure the temperature close to the sample. And so this one is sitting here on the left on the sample side. So now I'm going to demonstrate you how this in situ outgassing curves are recorded. So we load the sample at 760 torr, so basically one bar. We said the initial mass. Now, initially, I'm going to outgas the material only on the high vacuum. As you can see, outgassing rate is initially very high. So we have a weakly bound molecules coming off nicely. At certain point, the outgassing rate is slowing down and we're reaching almost extremely small outgassing rate plateau, which is demonstrated mass, mass data by the this solid red line here. One would can consider that this is almost, the sample is probably dry. Well, what I did actually, I increased the temperature 150 degrees and we observe further mass loss. So now what we observe is either releasing all those solvent molecules, which are inside of the pores or the structure of the materials, which was not possible by using the only the vacuum. It's not strong enough. So we need this uh, extra heat or extra energy for the release of this molecule, which was done here. Again, we say <clears throat> for a certain amount of time till the mass is completely dry. So this is in situ outgassing of the sample under high vacuum. Now, another example is outgassing of a 13x zeolite. This is a standard of shell of zeolites. <clears throat> so first picture on the left, I'm looking at outgassing at 25 degrees, pressure 10 minus 6 torr. Okay. What do you see here? The sample, the sorbent mile weight still going down. There is no sign of the plateau at all. So the outgassing rate is still pretty high. So even after 300 minutes waiting. So this suggests incomplete outgassing. So I've done the experiment, we should do data later. Now, the same material now was exposed to different outgassing conditions. So initially, material was uh, dry at 80 degrees to basically to release the water. Then I increased the temperature to 120, and then completely entered the pores and cleaned the surface to 300 degrees for several hours. And this, as you can see here, what we observe here, when you go to 300 degrees, you observe the plateau. The outgassing rate is not changed anymore. And even the sample mass does not change anymore. So we have nice flat line. So this we can consider as the complete outgassing of the adsorption. Now, how this can now affect our desorption experiment? So I've done the carbon dioxide adsorption on this uh, 13 x zeolite. So let's look at the first sample. Which was only outgassed at 25 degrees under high vacuum. So here you look at the kinetics. So solid uh, red is the mass, solid blue is the pressure. And I also zoom in on this part here. So it is very low pressures. You might probably, it's difficult to see, but the pressure 
of CO2 was increasing extremely small steps. So initially we have outgassing, since the pressure zero. So you see it's not completely, the outgassing rate is very high. I increase the pressure, let's say, to point to tau. Again, what we observe, the mass going down. We can, if we increase the pressure point four tau, please note that I'm using the pure CO2. Again, mass going down. So this suggesting that because the material was not completely dry, by flowing 20 SCCN of CO2 over the sample, I still drying the sample. The sample is not picking, absorbing the material. Then when we reach about one tor of CO2, we see sort of the plateau. And when you go to about 4.5 tor, we see stirs, stir, suddenly sample started picking up a little bit of uh, CO2, so the mass going up. So if you look at the ISO test, so the, the message to take is, the absorb, when you perform the CO2 absorption experiment with extremely low concentration of CO2, it's very important that the sub material is completely outgassed. Because if the material is not outgassed, what's going to happen is the absorption capacity is misleading. Because initially, depending, you're going to be actually dry the sample, sample, sample is going to only pick up the CO2 once it's completely actually dry. And here, if you look at the isotherm, it actually should be starting here. But initially, we are actually losing the mass. So this the, the uptake is about eight weight percent. Now the same material now outgassing at elevated temperatures, or, and the temperature were 1600 degrees, 1650, and 2400 degrees, and the cooling absorption temperature. Again, huge mass loss or outgassing rates demonstrated by the mass. And then in a week, when we increase the adsorption, when we increase the we introduce CO2 into the system, you observe in, in these very low pressures, very low concentrations down to the PPM low, we get nice, beautiful mass uptakes at each relative pressure step. And if you look at the isotherms, the absorption capacity is almost stable. Yeah? So we get at the very low, we can uh, micro, uh, obtain the feeling of micropoles at very low partial pressures of the CO2. So huge in the problem. Now, if you look, compare this data. Now, if we compare the adoption isotherm for material outgas at ambient temperature and vacuum and high temperature, we can see huge differences in adoption capacities. And also, you cannot see on the pore filling in this case. So this is just to demonstrate the effect of our gassing is can be really significant on our adsorption capacity. So if you look at the adoption capacity, very low concentrations. So here it demonstrates how this pore filling can be can only happen if the pores are completely empty, the micropore. Otherwise, not going to work. Now, the second example is going to be to look at the water vapor and carbon dioxide absorption and if you are going on this MOF 74. So we look at the magnesium MOF 74 as a starting material, and then the magnesium MOF 74 is functionalized with tetraethylene. Penta amine, uh, which is going to be called TEPA magnesium of 74. So now let's see the, how the effect of the outgassing and the functionalization will affect the adsorption data. So first, look at the water absorption data. So what we look at here, again, water absorption kinetics data for magnesium of 74 at 25 degrees. Sample was initially outgassed at 150 degrees, 10 minus 6 store for three hours. We observe almost 55% weight Okay, and as you can see, it's very outgassing rate is very fast. It's very easy to outgas. And then at each pressure step, it reach nice mass equilibrium. Now, when you look at the data here, so we look at the, we are now, and these slides are comparing two isotherms for the same sample. Well, the first sample was outgassed uh, at 150 degrees. The second same sample, but fresh sample was outgassed at 250 degrees. We can see two striking differences. First, the adsorption capacity of the sample outgas at 150 degrees is much higher at 25 degrees. The adsorption in red, the adsorption blue, history is small. Compared to the adsorption capacity of the uh, same fresh mold outgas at 250 degrees, adsorption in green, desorption in pink. This much larger hysteresis is suggesting there might be some structural changes might have Now, same we've done on the uh, Functionalized MOF 74. Again, we look at the water absorption kinetics. Again, material was outgassed 150 degrees, 10 minus 6 store, or 250 degrees, and 10 minus 6 store. So look at the isotherms. 
So if you look at the vapors option isotest, what we see, two striking differences. Again, first material out gas at 150 degrees, showing much higher absorption capacity, almost double, compared to the materials out gas at 250 degrees. So adsorption one in green, this option in pink is for the material out gas 150. Adsorption in red, this option in blue is for material out gas at 250 degrees. What we observe here, that if the that this sample be, is not my uh, undergone some structural changes due to the temperature. So we probably remove some of the solvents because we went to the high temperature. And as a result, we get much higher hysteresis gap here compared to the material out gas at 150 degrees. So, so this is clearly the effect of the temperature and the adsorption capacity on the material on the same sample. Now, we also look at the, the effects for, for these morph modes, for effects of outgassing and effects of the functionalization. So first, we look at the magnesium morph 74, which is adsorption isotherm, branches shown in the blue, so this is pretty good adsorption capacity. Now, now we look at the first X, X, X of the functionalization. Okay, So the solid adsorption, uh, the one bar or when we hit the excess of the amine and we outgas it at quite a lot of low temp mild temperature, only 150 degrees, show much lower adsorption capacity. Yeah. So this might be due to the suggesting due to the solvent, not completely removal of the solvent, or this was too much amine on the sample. Now, the other options that we have to look at is in the effect of the activation temperature. Now, let's look at the 150 degrees. Now, if the material, now we realize so if we use only same material now, this excess of the amines is activated 250 degrees. What we say here, the adsorption capacity is lower. Okay. So again, the effect of the temperature is clearly seen here. When you view the excess of the amines, if the temperature is too high, 250 degrees, adsorption branch in red, compared to the Adsorption isotherm collected at 150 degrees for the outgassing conditions is much higher adsorption capacity. So what is suggesting the temperature again, temperature was too high, there was some structural rearrangements or removal of the solvent. As a result, the adsorption capacity for CO2 is low. Then we look at the excess of the amines. So we have only use only 1% of amines, and we outgas the material at 150 degrees. As a result, what we see here. We get the much higher, we receive the really high the adoption capacity for this material. So, so we've done these experiments in order to understand the degree of the functionalization and also the, the effect of the outgassing temp temperature on the adsorption capacity, which is uh, very important as it's demonstrated here, because by playing with this, uh, playing with these two parameters, we can we clearly demonstrate it, how we can actually tune the adsorption capacities uh, for these uh, absorbing. And this is very important because if you look at the reports in the literature, these conditions are usually, despite their importance, not really uh, recorded or discussed in a great detail, which is a pity because it might give explanation and understanding and differences of the performance of these different materials. So now I come to my last slide, which is the conclusion. I hope I didn't bore you very much, but I hope I show you that these dynamic uh, vapor absorption uh, vacuum systems is an uh, excellent system for the monitoring of the vapor absorption during outgassing of the material at the different temperatures. And uh, also, it provides you the important information about the cleanliness of the surface and the pores. And also, I hope you was able to demonstrate you that differences in adsorption capacity can be clearly attributed to the outgassing conditions, which was demonstrated on the water absorption, on water absorption or carbon dioxide absorption data. Now, in the, my last slide, I would just like to acknowledge my colleagues at surface measurement systems for their help and support. And also I would like to acknowledge uh, my collaborators from uh, MIT Chemical Engineering, Alan Hutton, Lev Bromberg, and Shell Su for providing uh, of the sam more samples for this study. That's really and lastly, I would like to thank you to all for your attentions. 
And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask or send me an email. And the floor is now open to discussion. Thank you very much, Brad. That was a fantastic session. Uh, we have a few questions come in already. Uh, the first one from Mohammed Abbas, who would like to know, how do we know when equilibri equilibrium is reached? This is a very good question, Mohammed. So the, this is the graphing metric. We said the mass equilibrium criteria. So what it means, when we perform the adsorption measurements, we define the change in the mass criteria, basically the plateau for the measurement. So in a typical experiment, this is done by defining that if the change in the mass is below 0.002% per minute for duration of 10 minutes, then the software automatically control to the next steps. So this is how we define uh, literally the mass equilibrium criteria for this option experiment. Thank you. Uh, our next question from Daryl Jan, he has asked, if the capacity of the MOF has been adversely changed by exposure to high temperature, is it possible to recover by some sort of treatment to the MOF, or is it necessary to completely change out the sorbent? So this is the question. In this case, uh, there are lots of measurements. It is not possible to recover this absorption because as I, these changes caused but the exposure of the MOF to the high temperature causes structural changes or chemical changes to the structure. So what, what I mean by that is that some of the solvent was pro probably removed. And as a result, rearrangement happened, which was not actually favorable for the adsorption capacity of the MOFs anymore. So if you repeat the experiment, even with low adsorption capacity, especially in this case, if it, I was not able to recover the adsorption capacities which were obtained initially for outgassing at 150 degrees. So if you do first 250 degrees experiment, let's say carbon dioxide adsorption, then you can move to 150 degrees. You're not gonna get higher adsorption capacity anymore. You need to use the fresh sample. And I would also suggest actually to get more understanding of this, what's actually happened to the structure, probably diffraction, extra diffraction will be good techniques to actually or actually, to look at the structure of the material in position of the solvent, rearrangement of the solvents of the linkers on the MOF. Thank you, Vlad. We have a question here from Bob Grasso. If you plot the adsorption capacity as a function of degassing temperature, I assume you will get a peak. Is it good practice to just use the temperature of that peak for degassing, or can you suggest other issues to check? Oh, this is a good question, Bob. Uh, I I think your suggestion is uh, pretty good. I mean, I would like the the other suggestion would be look at the, the I usually we usually look at the TGA data first, so we want to know where the decomposition happened. And also the other suggestion is also before we do the design about the outgassing uh, condition, like the order of these tests which should be prior to these measurements would be like the first, the understanding of the structure, understanding of the TGA data where the actually decomposition happened. And the last thing would be just to try to couple of different outgassing conditions. I think that may be all the questions we have for today. Would you like to add anything at the end there, Vlad? Oh, just if you have any further questions or you would like to discuss more in detail some of the stuff, please don't hesitate to contact me or why John. So I'm happy to have a discussion with you over the email over the phone. And I wish all our attendees a really good afternoon or evening.